The following video is intended for general audiences. It may contain coarse language, bad puns, suggestive images, and bad advice. It probably just contains retro computer crap. But don't try this at home, even if I tell you to. Hi there, uh, I just wanted to do a quick little video to show some things you can do with my TI-99 emulator, Classic 99, that may not be entirely obvious. Um, as a programmer's emulator, it has a lot of features that normal emulation doesn't necessarily have. So, quick little video, I put together a little list of things that you can do with it, and it's, uh, I hope you find it somewhat entertaining. If not, well, I had fun making it, so it's all good. So, first off, let's talk about the clipboard. Windows has a clipboard, the TI does not, but a long time ago I put in this little feature, Edit Paste, and this lets you paste text data from the, key, from the clipboard directly into the Classic 99 keyboard. Uh, people use this a lot on Atari Age, for instance, for pasting listings of programs, which is an awesome use for it. So, of course, everybody sort of knows that you can do that, so we'll go into TI Basic. Um, don't mind that rainbow thing, that'll come later. Um, let's actually do Extended Basic, Reset, so we'll go into Extended Basic, and then we can like pop over to Atari Age and get some uh, program listings. So sometimes 99er is great for uploading these great tiny little demos that do impressive things in a few lines of code. And all you have to do is go up there, copy the text, switch back over to Classic 99, edit, and paste. And then we can just hit run, and we see his magic. And this is a large text demo. It's terrific. I love this. It's like typing in program listings without the time of actually having to type. So, excellent. That works great. Um, one place that this doesn't work so great, though, is if you have listings with really long lines in them. For instance, I have one here from the SSSG Racer. Line 125 here, it's pretty darn long. I have to watch over there so you can see that. So if I were to try and paste that into uh, Extended Basic, then you can see it doesn't finish the line. It runs out of space. And you would have to hit Enter, and then bring up the line again, and scroll to the end, and ty type the rest of the stuff that you missed. And, you know, that's pff, what a waste of time. So instead, what I've done is added this little paste XB feature. This uh, lengthens the input line buffer and deletes a lot of the extra spaces that you'll find, like around the colons. So all I have to do is say paste XB, and that same line now fits nicely. No problems. It's in there. And by doing something like that, I can take the whole program and paste XB, and the whole thing flies into memory as quickly as quick as you can be, but you still have to sit and wait for it. And then we can just go ahead and run, and I believe this program wants overdrive anyway, so we'll turn that on. <laughs> Atari H logo. And look at that, there we go. Press fire to start. Hmm, appears that with overdrive the music's too, uh... Anyway, there we go. Little TI basis, extended basic racing game part of the short and sweet competition and that was done for us by um, by Kurt so you can see his now you can see his name great little game great little demo alright great so that's pretty easy and everybody knows that but you can also paste it's not limited to basic you can paste into editor assembler just as easily so we come into editor assembler and go into the editor and we can just as easily just go ahead and paste here and we'll get the the lines are too long for editor assembler escape to cancel the paste um, normally you would be pasting text of course but program listing is what I had and that works just fine uh, anything that's pure text will work oh, that's great but what else can you do with it? I mean is it just useful for pasting program listings? Well no you can actually do every key press in your system startup, and for that, I've created just a quick and sturdy little startup. Um, let me actually find that one again now. Here we go. So I wrote this little script here, and what it does is it puts a little vanity title on top of my Zombie XB program. It shows that I cracked it. I am the Texan. Ha ha ha. So you know, 
so what, what have we got here? Well, we've got a couple of key presses to get past the master title page, and then two to select Extended Basic. Extended Basic has a dummy keyboard read at the beginning, so we had to drop another key press in there to get past that, and then an old command to just go ahead and load the Extended Basic program. Uh, list command just to show that you can do that. Insert a couple of new lines of text and go ahead and run that bugger. So we're going to ahead copy that. We'll come over here, make sure we're running Extended Basic, and then we just go ahead and paste. And it will do all those steps. Now you'll notice that the run didn't enter. I didn't include a blank uh, a carriage return at the end of the run. The paste will continue until the next keyboard scan after the last character, so in order to prevent overdrive from running forever, I just went ahead and uh, got rid of that. And we hit enter, we hit run, and uh, again I'm going to turn on overdrive because it's slow otherwise. And you can see there we go with Farmer Owen. Ha! Cracked by the Texan, yes. Alright, yay. That's fun. But, uh, well, that's that's kind of handy. You could, if, while you're developing, you can set up a little notepad with your common uh, commands. I actually do this when I'm using Editor Assembler a lot to automatically go ahead and use Load and Run to load each of my files and then run them all in one paste command. That also works just as well as working in Basic. But there's still more that you can do. So the last thing that you can do with pasting is you can actually set it up inside your classic 99.ini file and to do that, you just create a, a, your user cart uh, as usual, whatever you need it to be. Um, you'll see here that I'm loading an other file, and this turns out to be extended basic. But this one, ROM1 here, is the interesting line. K means keyboard paste. The address line and size become invalid, and the rest just becomes key presses. So you'll see what we do here is, again, a couple keys to get past the master title page. Two to se select extended basic. Uh, dummy 2 just because extended basic eats the first character and then a run command which will load and run a file off the disk this backslash n at the end represents pressing enter so if I go ahead and I copy that and we're sitting at the master title page all I have to do is go paste and you'll see well you'll see that that didn't work well at all because I forgot to actually copy the uh, commands I believe oh sorry Ugh. It's too bad I can't go back and redo that. So, this was not a paste example. So, blah blah blah, back up, bloop, 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 talking backwards. So, we've got this set up as user cart named testxb, and the keyboard commands work just like I said, but it's a cartridge, so you just select it from the cartridge menu. So, we go into here under my user carts, jump down to testxb, which is actually right off the bottom of your screen, but it, trust me, it's here and you'll see that it just does everything automatically right off the bat. Now, that is because the keyboard presses are part of loading the cartridge. So by doing that you can actually have any cartridge auto start, jump into whatever part you want, and just have it all run automatically up to one line worth of text. And you'll see that even if I reset it'll do the same thing. It just automatically sends those keys into the buffer, fires through, and everything comes up and runs. Again, any cartridge, any key presses, um, there are very few exceptions. Anything that doesn't use K-Scan will fail for pasting, but everything that does use K-Scan will work just perfectly. So, edit paste, that's really handy, but what else can you do with the clipboard? Well, I think just about everybody knows that the clip device is a, load in, is a, a device in the system that lets you access the clipboard as if it were a disk drive. So I'm just going to make sure overdrive is on here. For instance, I'm running a program here. If I list to clip, then it's going to head and dump a listing of this program to the clipboard, which you can then paste out with normal Windows commands. And I'll show you that as soon as this finishes. I uh, probably should have used a shorter program, but that's OK. So let's just erase that. Edit, paste. And there is the program listing that we just dumped to the clipboard. So that works really well, and I believe everybody kind of knows that. Um, of course, it's a file device, so you don't have to do simple listings of programs. Uh, you can use it from anything that can access a disk device. For instance, in Editor Assembler, we can go into Editor Assembler here. We can say, edit, edit. This is a little thing in Editor Assembler, which I spelled Assembler wrong, but that's okay. Mind the typos. 
Okay, no problem. Yeah, that's fine. Great. So we're back out of there. Now we want to save that just to the clipboard. We don't want to waste disk space on it. So we say yes or no, doesn't matter. Clip dot. Uh, Editor Assembler always thinks you need a file name. So if you don't put the dot there, you actually get a device error. But the clipboard device doesn't care if there's a file name or not. So that's enough. Okay, and it's all saved. We'll come back into here. And again, edit, paste, and there we go. So works both ways. You can read to the clipboard, you can write to the clipboard, both directions. Works just fine. So, of course, I just told you, it works just fine, right? So, why don't we prove that? So here's the sample of what I wanted to demonstrate for the clipboard. This is just copy and paste from my, um, my summary document that I'm trying to follow here so I don't say um too often. Okay, terrific. So we go over there, we're just going to select all that, copy to the clipboard, come back into Classic 99, Purge, load, clip, dot, enter, and there it is. So again, it's just a file device. It's not tied to basic or extended basic or editor assembler in any way whatsoever. You can read and save any text uh, information to it. The only real limitation is on the TI side, it expects that it's going to be display variable or display fixed, and probably 80, call, 80 uh, character records, but it doesn't enforce that. Okay, lots of fun stuff in there. Um, did you know, by the way, that escape is function 9? You can use it to back out of menus. Let's move on to text files, because it's sort of related to what we just did. You can also access Windows text files from Classic 99. In fact, the, with the default settings, Classic 99 will actually treat anything with a .txt extension as a Windows text file and read that happily. If we look at the configuration here, and I didn't close all files, but we're at the title screen, so this is safe, you'll see that there's actually quite a number of options in here for dealing with text files. In particular, I want to look at these ones right now. Read Windows text as display variable, and read Windows text as display fixed. This just says to, Win to Classic 99 that if you open a file and it has a .txt extension on it, and you open in display variable mode, is it okay to treat that as a Windows text file? This box says yes. If you say no, and it doesn't have a proper header, then of course Classic 99 will say, well, I don't know what that file is then, and re throw an error. But on the next option for display fixed files. So it depends on what mode you open them as. Normally, it doesn't matter which one you want to open them as. And so we'll clear out of there, and we'll go back into Editor Assembler. And we'll go into Edit and Load. And let's load classic 99's what's new dot text file. It's too long to fit in memory. It's, you know, a couple hundred K, but this will do its best. So the dot text extension, uh, extensions mean nothing to classic 99 except in this particular case. Uh, it just passes the extension on to Windows. But it does look in this case because it's like, well, that doesn't have a TI files header. Can I treat it as Windows text? Uh, dot .text and dot .obj for compatibility with the sm 994 a assembler are both treated that way. So we'll let that go ahead and run. It's going to be reading the file off the disk. It should come up with a memory full error in a second. I think I will... Oh, there it goes. I'm going to overdrive anyway. Now we'll go ahead and edit, and there it is. The classic 99 what's new dot .text read from Windows text. No problems. Okay, great. So you can read Windows text files. Well, can you save Windows text files? You probably noticed in the options menu here, yes, that's fine, that yes, you can. You can write DV80 so as Windows text, write all DV files as Windows text, write disk F80 as Windows text, and write all DF files as Windows text. And this means pretty much what it says. It says if you open a file for writing as DV80, and this option is set on this disk drive, then that will be saved as a Windows text file instead of a TI file. And you can likewise say all DV files, regardless of record length, and then the same for fixed files. And that's nice. It's not too bad. A little inconvenient to have to change this just to create one file, though, don't you think? I think it is. So what if you could just do it dynamically? And that is actually very possible. So we're going to go into Purge again. And what we do is there's file type overrides available in Classic 99. And there are three of them. There's one for Windows text files, one for TI files headers, 
and one for V99 file headers. So you can actually save any of these types of files from within the emulator without having to go change your disk configuration. Um, you would do that if it's a one-off thing. If you do it all the time, it's better to set up a dedicated disk number for that type of file and just always write to it instead. So, you know, okay, that's terrific. So let's go ahead and let's load something. Um, now let's just create something new, what the heck. So this is is a new editor assembler entered file. It is a TI file with TI text. Or is it? Yeah, hee hee hee. Okay, so there we go, we've got that. So if we just go ahead and we save that, for, I'm just using variable for convention, it doesn't matter. And we'll just save it as disk one test dot text. Now, we're saving, so the extension has no meaning. So this is just going to write a plain old TI files file because that's my configuration. And then I want to show you that, so we're going to prove it. Um, well, we were going to, but I closed the folder at some point, so I'll just open it here. Okay, and we'll just jump down to test. So there's test.text. And if I try to open this in Windows, well, that's not very useful, is it? You can see the TI files header, so you know that's a TI files file. Kind of annoying. I mean, I could go into the disk configuration options. Oh, editor assembler, why don't you close your files? Go into here, and I could say, well, you know, write that as Windows text. And yes, that will work, but it's this is a one-time thing. It's the only time I'm going to do it. So instead, I'm going to save, yes, disk1, override as Windows, dot test2, dot text. So this question mark W, uh, Classic 99 looks for this little header to, set, to pass an option to the DSR, which says, well, I want this to be written as Windows text. And you can pass that question mark W for Windows text, question mark T to force a TI files header, no matter what your config is, or question mark V to pass a V99 style header, no matter what your options are set to. So hit enter, OK, and come back to the directory, and there's our file. And if I open that, look at that, Windows text. Didn't change configuration. This little shortcut can save you a lot of time if you just need a one-off save, or if you just want to convert a file header. All right, so moving on to that. Something that Classic 99 has had as long as it's had disk is the ability to do subdirectories. So I'm going to jump here into back into Extended Basic. Subdirectories work anywhere that you have enough characters space to type the path, and they work just like in Windows using the backslash. But the main problem that we have is that the TI disk system is what most programs were written around, and the TI disk system limits you to just 10 characters of text. When you start adding subdirectories, it's really easy to get past 10 characters. Classic 99 does not have this 10 character restriction, so anywhere that you're free to type, for instance, in BASIC, in Editor Assembler, in most TI programs, in fact, uh, TI Artist works, anywhere that lets you type more than 10 characters, you can use subdirectories. In fact, if you only have 10 characters, you can still use subdirectories as long as your file names are short enough. So in my disk1 folder, I actually have a whole bunch of subdirectories, and I have a bunch of stuff stored in this one called X because it's short. So let's see here. Oh, let's load up something that's actually going to, to work. There's Eliza. Let's load Eliza. And we just go all disk1 X Eliza. And that loads directly from that subfolder. And I'm going to have to overdrive again, aren't I? Yep. And we run, and of course everything is perfectly fine. My emulator has bugs. Ah, see, Eliza doesn't even care. Excellent. And of course this also works in Editor Assembler. For instance, I can just switch back to that. Dunk, dunk. Five, disk one, x slash, I think demo was in there. And you notice, now that loaded three files, demo, demo p, and demo q, and I'm going to have to kill that. You can't hear the music, but I can. And because the TI convention is to just increment the last character of the file name, it doesn't care that there's a path in front of it. It just works. So subdirectories, very handy. A uh, good way to organize your files. Now, I mentioned the 10 character limit. Classic 99 I'm trying to come up with a better disk system than the original TI disk controller because, you know, it was nice for the day and it was not too restrictive, but come on. I have 
a, two terabytes of disk in my computer. I have, you know, file name support for longer than 256 characters. I'm really not interested in being limited to 10 characters of text in my file names. So Classic 99 supports two nice little features, and these are just side effects of the file system. They're really not specially coded in any way, shape, or form. One is that you can have any number of files in a directory. For instance, here's my disk 9, and I uh, see you can't actually tell too easily. There we go. Oops. Oh, that didn't work. There we go. I have 318 items in this folder. Classic 99 has no problem with this because, you know, it doesn't care. It's not interested in the full folder listing. Another thing that I have, and I've put these in here specifically, are long file names. These are far more than 10 characters in length. But again, Classic 99 has no problem. So let's start by demonstrating the long file names. So we can go 5 disk 9 uh, long file name. And you saw that it was three pro files long. I don't think I actually tested this. There we go. And it loads my PSG mod player. No problems. Editor assembly doesn't care how long it is, although there is an internal length. I wouldn't go much longer than like 15, 20 characters for most apps. But the point is that it works. Now, the place that it starts to have a little bit of problem is applications that assume they're talking to a TI disk controller. Now these applications have two limitations. First, they think file names are 10 characters long, and that's it. End, end of story. They also think that there's only 127 files in a folder. Now, the second one is easier to counter. Not every program does um, cache the da data, so not every program assumes the 127 files. Some of them just read to the end. For instance, our famous catalog program in TI Basic doesn't care. It reads one record, prints it to the screen, throws it away, gets the next one. That program will happily access a long directory. So let's see how that looks. So come into here, and I've got the, the program already stored on my disk here. There's nothing uh, unusual about this. Oops, sorry. Overdrive again. I'm just going to do a quick list, and it's going by kind of fast. Now, what's different from the one in the uh, man in the disk controller manual is that I've renamed all the variables and put comments in because I was tired of figuring out what it does every time I look at it. But it's your standard program. The only thing that I've changed in here is it's got a counter so that you can see how many files it has displayed. So I'm just going to go ahead and run it. And let's look at disk 1 to start with because this is a normal disk. It doesn't have too much on it. And I have overdrive on so it's running kind of fast but you'll see that the file names are kind of truncated to 10 characters and it's going ahead, it's, it's doing its thing as best it can. So I've got 83 files in that folder. Now I showed you disk 9, so let's look at that. And it's going to go ahead and do 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 running through all the files again. Now you'll notice the file names are truncated just like they were and it's actually going to stop at 127. Because programs make these assumptions, they crash if you break those assumptions and so Oh, I just made a liar out of me. I'm sorry. I'm just going to back up and do that again because I didn't want you to see that yet. Dunk, dunk. Okay. So let's just pretend it stopped at 127. By the time I'm done talking, it will have. So these programs, they make assumptions, and they crash if you break those assumptions. Crashing is bad, so Classic 99 doesn't want to encourage it. By default, the options for long directory listings and long file names as you can see, this one is cut off, and it stopped at 127. By default, those options are turned off. So let's say you want to use them. You're not, you know that you can't use certain software on, these, on this stuff, or it's going to crash. So no problem. OK. So you already saw it once. I'm just going to go back in. Allow more than 127 files in a directory. This is safe for most applications. It's probably not safe for disk managers, however, because they store all the file names, and if you have more than 127 files, and they're not expecting that, they may overwrite themselves and crash. It's up to you to know that it's safe to turn this on. The other is enable long file names. Now, I'm going to come back to long file names, but right at this moment, I'm just going to say it is safe to turn this on, always, and I'll explain why. So now that's turned on just for disk 9. All the other disks are untouched, just disk 9 has those options. So if we do this again, we're going to now be able to see all the files in the folder, well past 127, all the way up to 300 and whatever the number was. But you may notice as it's scrolling by, file name's still truncated. 
That's kind of strange, isn't it? So why is that? Well, when I was testing with long file names, what I found was that programs just barf immediately. They just crash. They don't expect the longer records even when the disk even when the DSR tells them that the records are longer. Basic has no problem. Basic just does what it's told, but for instance I tested with TI Artist and it just crashed immediately. Crashing is a bad thing as I've mentioned. So, this is what I've done. If we look at how a disk directory is opened, this is how you open a disk directory in the disk manager using the device, uh, not raw sector access. So you, you open the device name, which would be in this case DSK9 dot. You open it for input, you ask for relative and internal, and what's not listed here is that the record type is fixed and the length is zero. The DSR looks at that, returns a fixed record length of 38, which is just happens to be the length of the, of the data, and everything is perfectly happy. Because it wasn't safe to lengthen file names, what I did instead was made a very small change to the open format. If you want long file names, all you have to do is open for variable length. Now, relative files cannot be variable, so we delete the relative and just say variable. So now we're opening for non-relative, so for sequential file and for variable zero. My program will return or my DSR will return a variable at length record of 254, so you have to be prepared for that. And that simple change is all it takes. If we run this now on disk 9, which is the only thing that supports it, we will now get long file names. And I'm going to stop it early so that you can see a long file name 1. And now that's, that's all it takes. And so you can read long file name directories just, just that easily. So what happens if we run this elsewhere? Well, disk 1 doesn't have that option on, so it actually throws an error. It does not recognize that you want variable length records. That switch is all it takes to turn it on and off. That way we can still have long file names and we don't break backwards programs. So it's my hope that that simple little change, changing requesting a variable length record instead of a fixed length record, might be adopted as a long file name standard going forward which probably won't happen until my MPD comes out and we can actu actually access file systems from the real TI, but, you know, I'm hopeful. If anybody else comes to it first, that's my proposal. It's simple, it works, it doesn't break anything. Okay, let's move on. So, TI Artist was the next thing on my list. Everybody loves TI Artist, right? Actually, I don't know how many people have seen TI Artist. Great little paint program. Oh, I was too slow. There we go. Go into Artist. There we go. That looks terrific. Yay. So, TI Artist. I have a folder on disk 2 that contains a whole bunch of pictures. I mean, a lot. Uh, if I get an index, though, you won't see very many. And the reason that there are so few here is because of the file name length issue. Uh, TI Artist asks for the file names, it gets a truncated file name, it doesn't see its little underscore p and underscore c extension, so it doesn't think it's a picture, so it doesn't show up here. But when it comes to actually loading from this index, you know, no problem. It has no problem whatsoever with that whole concept. Okay, so that that's fine. TI Artist works and runs. It's just to show you that it boots and runs. Um, there's a couple things I wanted to show you. First is that long file names work even though the directory does not. If we take a look here, this is a sample of my folder. Now, the application you're looking at is called Thumbs Plus, and the reason you can see these pictures is because I wrote a Photoshop plugin that can load TI Artist. Now, the Photoshop plugin requires that the files have a unique extension but TI files don't have extensions. The file name for a TI artist file was like artist underscore P for the picture and underscore C for the color. That doesn't translate very well on the PC which wants dot extension. So what I did was I, I called the picture file TIAP for TI artist plus or picture and then the color file is TIAC and you don't see it here. The plugin automatically associates the two files and Thumbs Plus is just a nice handy little program because it can use Photoshop filters and plugins to load images. So from this I can actually look at all my converted TI pictures in one place and browse them quickly and easily. So that's great. So this file that I have selected here, Butterfox, this file name is too long. 
I should actually back up briefly. Um, Classic 99 recognizes .tiap and .tiac and automatically renames the files when the program asks for them to underscore p and underscore c. And it goes both directions. So that way, I'm going to be, even though this is butterfox.tiap, I'm going to go ask for it in TI Artist, and Classic 99 will say, okay, TI Artist is asking for butterfox underscore p. I know to rename that to TIAP. Um, that may be a little confusing. You could just say it's magic that works in the background. So even though it doesn't show up here because the name is too long, I can still say load and I can just type the name directly because I know what it's called. And there's the picture loaded in TI Artist. And that just that works really well. But well that's actually the whole thing, to be completely honest, is just the automatic remapping and another demonstration that long file names work. The uh, automatic remapping is handy because it allows you to manage the files on your PC without dealing with the TI naming convention. It's all handled automatically in the emulator. Let's go ahead and move on to something simpler. Let's get out of here. Okay. So, there's another option in the disk menu that not everybody may be aware of, and that is right under your configuration line it says open. And all that does is just what it says. Instead of having to go to your file manager and browse your computer system to try and figure out where you map that drive to, you can just click right here and the folder pops up. So there's my disk one folder. And if you're using disk images instead, as some people still do, he <laughs> So I have one set up here. You can still say this. And if you have TI99DIR associated with .disk files on your system, which you probably do, you can just do this and it will automatically launch TI99DIR with the disk that you've just asked for. And you can go ahead and have a look at stuff. So that's just a handy little feature that I thought was worth mentioning. Alright, let's move on to another device that I don't think anybody's taken advantage of just going to jump into TI Basic here. Classic 99 em sort of loosely emulates the, the standard clock device and it reads the PC clock when it does this. So I've written a quick little program to demonstrate this that runs in Basic. I'm just going to paste that in. And we just run that and it opens clock and there we go. It is 2345.17 on Sunday 11.27.11. And yes, it is getting late. But yeah, whatever. I'm having fun. So you can see here, it just does an open to the clock, inputs three string variables. The first string variable, A, is the day of the week, and it runs from 1 to 7. The second string variable, B, is the, I'm sorry, I'm confusing myself here, is the date, and it's always formatted month, day, year, um, just like that. And finally, the C string is the current time and it's always formatted in 24 hours like this. Now there is one small caveat with this that the old clock device on the TI would never have possibly done and I'm only aware of this from reading the MSDN documentation on the clock. Modern systems uh, understand the concept of a leap second and leap seconds are added periodically by scientists and other you know, fancy muckety-mucks when they decide that the world is falling behind and they need to get one more second in order to catch up on whatever they're doing. So leap sec when leap seconds are added, you can actually have a seconds of 60. Of course, old clock systems never had this concept. They had no way to know when a leap second was scheduled anyway because you couldn't update them. So a TI would never have shown, for instance, 23, 45, 60. In honesty, your PC will almost never do that, and the odds of you catching it doing that are almost nil. But it could happen here. It couldn't happen before. I can't conceive of a case where it'll actually break something, but just a difference to be aware of, because we're accessing a different clock device. Right. I bet you were hoping that was the end of the video, but not quite. We're almost there, though. Just two more things to cover. I have this little feature in here called mouse based typing and what the idea is is that by double clicking on things on the screen with the mouse you can actually send key presses and navigate your application. 
I actually took a look through my library and I don't have very much that's completely menu based so I couldn't come up with a great demonstration of this but what I ended up deciding I would show you was we'll use my MPD bring that up and it's already set up for us the one I didn't want it to be but that's okay don't worry about that I forgot I added save support it uh, the idea is you just double click anywhere and whatever it double clicks on it sends the character under the mouse pointer to the emulator so press any key to begin so we can double click anywhere alright and this is my fake 1998 title and as you can see I was testing GROM overloads uh, I decided the 998 had the would have the ability to read all GROM bases on one menu mostly because I thought that would be cool so that's why all this is in here but um, that aside we can go ahead and I can select anything just by pointing and double clicking and there we go now we're in disk manager okay well how about uh, file utilities load a file disk one sounds good now clicking here would be dangerous because of the blinking cursor I'd have to catch it when it's off but here's a one that's perfectly useful for me to use this is kind of gaming the system of course if I wanted a different disk I'd probably have to reach over to the keyboard and type it but I can do one okay great okay let's say I wanted to type bmtest.txt well to do that you press N until you get down to the file and then you press T well here's a whole bunch of N's and just sit here and double click N until it gets down there this is really gaming the system I know but it does work <laughs> Now I need to type it. Well, is there a T anywhere on the screen? Oh, there's a whole pile of them. Yeah, look at that. I haven't touched the keyboard yet. Press any key. Oh, I can double click to continue. It's kind of hacky. It's kind of silly, but you know it does work. And uh, I'm sure there's a program out there somewhere that's completely menu-driven that it might be useful for. Of course, getting out of here, I'm just going to push escape, and escape, and escape, and escape. Well, escape doesn't work there. Quit. So, okay, well, let's see. Let's go into the MPD config and let's change it back to a regular 99.4. Still just using the mouse. I haven't touched the keyboard yet. TI Basic, all right. Well, there's no way to push enter with the mouse, so enter it is. Excellent. 